Adventures for the month of March. Um, and the first item is remote attendance, and we've already had just a little bit of a discussion about how remote attendance isn't going to work very well if right. a real clampdown is put on because you got to have a physically present quorum to qualify under the law. Oh, we could have one here, one in the ready room, and one in the office chair. Well, well <laughs> assuming they could get here is what I'm assuming Michael means. But anyway, yep. If the um, National Guard hasn't been alerted. So let's move on to uh, our executive session. So we uh, have on the agenda an executive session for essentially discussing personnel matters. <laughs> Do we have a motion to go into executive session? I will read this lovely suggested motion. In accordance with section two, part C, exception number one of the Illinois Opens Meeting Act, I move to adjourn to executive session for the limited purpose of discussing the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees. Second. <gasps> Second. That's been seconded. Moved and seconded. <laughs> Is there any discussion or questions on the point? I Hearing none, know. let's do a roll call vote and, and in honor of Roger being back. Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Is your voice back? She's going through puberty. <laughs> <She's wrong. laughs> I thought you were joking when I first heard it. It's no, terrible. <laughs> We're start to We are going to go down the hall yeah. so that people can <laughs> start. I would like to call us back to order in our regular uh, meeting. And uh, the next item of business here is to accept the agenda for the remainder of the meeting. Is there a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. And it's been seconded by <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Cunningham. <laughs> Is there any discussion on the point? All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? And that carries unanimously. <laughs> uh, time for public comment, and I don't see anybody from the public here to comment to us, so we can move right along. And I don't believe we have any new staff introductions. Is that no. correct? <clears throat> okay. Uh, the UPDAC report. There was a written report from uh, Gene Paley. I presume everyone's had a chance to look at that. I did have one comment on that, and does time really fly this fast that our tree census was done 13 years ago? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's still current. <laughs> it, is, it is up to date. We've been updating it every time we take yeah, yeah. Size of the trees has changed in 13 years. Yeah, well, really. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, that's good. It was a really interesting meeting, and I, I think that the, the folks who were there, and there were a lot of people there, it was an extraordinarily well, well attended meeting, um, were fascinated and had no idea mm -hmm. that we had, that we keep such close tabs essentially on, on the trees, and they certainly weren't unhappy about it. Yeah, it was. It was well attended. Everybody was interesting, interested. It was good all the way around. Yeah. Yep. Okay. If there are no further comments or questions on that. Let's move on to our consent agenda. And on the consent agenda for this evening is the approval of the minutes of the two meetings in February, the February 4 board study session and the February 11 regular board meeting. Uh, action to accept the philanthropy report and gifts listed with gratitude, the monthly departmental reports from administration, planning and operations and recreation, and lastly, approval of the monthly paid accounts payable. So, and under our consent agenda rules, any commissioner alone has the right to remove any or all of these items for separate discussion and action. Is there any commissioner wishing anything to be removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, then uh, do we have a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda in an omnibus fashion? I move to approve all the action items on the consent agenda and accept all the information items listed on the consent agenda in an omnibus manner. Second. <laughs> I, 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 yes, I think, I think Nancy was first on that one. 
Um, and it has been moved and seconded, and under the consent agenda rules at this point, there is to be no further discussion. So we will hold a roll call vote, starting with LaShonda at the left. Aye. 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 And that carries unanimously with all five commissioners voting. Uh, that <laughs> takes us on to reports, of financial reports, Katie. Right. Um, I will be presenting to you the financial performance of the Park District through February of 2020. The first report that I'll discuss is the revenue and expenditures report. This is um, a budget report that shows the receipts and expenditures for the prior 12 month period, the budget for the current period, and the preliminary unaudited results for the 10 months ending February 29th. Highlights of this report, if you look at sum one is the first page of this report, it is all funds except for the capital improvements fund. Revenues for this period were $11,373,000, which is an increase of $392,000 since January. Uh, we've received just shy of $7 million in revenues from property taxes, and we received our final property tax distribution for levy year 18 finally in February. So um, it just came mid-February. And a lot of that 392 increase in revenues was that final property tax distribution, about 250,000 of it. Expenditures for this period were $11,101,000, which is a change of 524,000 since January. We have a surplus after 10 months, which means there's an excess of revenues over expenditures paid of $272,000. Sum two is on the second page of the report and it shows only the capital improvements fund Revenues for this period were $7,556,000 and expenditures were $894,000. Revenues exceed expenditures, which leaves a net increase in fund balance in the capital improvements fund of $6,662,000. And I did, I mentioned last month that I was gonna talk to our auditors about amending the budget and um, we're gonna do it as part of our April revision next month. So uh, it shouldn't be an issue because uh, the revenue, I, I also have an email into Matt just to make sure, but it's basically because our revenues increased, our, um, it, we don't have to do the newspaper posting because the revenues and the, are, the, are the reason that we're amending the budget is because we got the bond revenues that increased it and we're not really gonna have uh, appropriations that exceed what we already appropriated for the fiscal year. So we'll go ahead and amend it accordingly, but expenditure wise. Um, we also, I wrote in my board report about how we're gonna have to, um, we basically have to report in our CAF for the gross amounts. So this report only shows the net amounts. Like we received bond proceeds of that like $6 million from the series 2000 a bond. Um, but really it was like a 14, almost $15 million bond. And then we paid off 9 million of other bonds. So those net numbers, those gross numbers, excuse me, actually have to go in our CAFR. So I did write about that in my board report. Happy to answer any other questions about it, but that will be part of the revision that we make to the um, budget in April. Um, moving on to sum three. This is the first two pages added, added together. It's all funds district-wide. And please note the bottom right-hand corner that our ending fund balance for the whole district on February 29th is $14,197,000. Following that are the summary reports for the individual working funds, which are the general fund, the recreation fund, the museum fund, and the indoor pool. And we're really wrapping up the year. Everything's pretty much on budget, so we're doing well. Next, I'll talk about the treasurer's report. This is a report of the amount of cash that the district has on one day, February 29th, 2020. Excuse me, all 24 funds are listed with which accounts the funds are invested in for a grand total for February of $16,205,078.97. At the top of page two are um, the list of interest bearing accounts that the district has. So of that 16, million two hundred thousand we have fifteen million four hundred and four thousand in interest bearing accounts uh, we didn't have any activity in those accounts of note for this period so everything's 
pretty much the same other than fluctuating and decreasing interest rates with the, this new economic crisis that we're entering into. And I was really thankful because we reinvested a bunch of CDs in January before yeah. all that. So I bet you the interest rates have tanked even more since then. And, right. you know, they're laddered CDs, so it'll catch up to us when we reinvest them down the road. But at least we locked it in for a little while longer. Yep. Okay, and there were no changes to interfund loans this period. And finally, the disbursements section on page three, we had total disbursements of funds of $439,000. And I present the treasurer's report to you for approval. I move we accept the treasurer's report for audit. Second. That's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that carries unanimously. I'll, uh, now I'll talk about the uh, areas that there's been activity in the capital budgets this month. Uh, last month in January, we spent like three or $400,000 in the capital improvements fund, but this month we only spent 20,000. So there's really very little activity to discuss. But um, in the series 2019A uh, bond on the top page, we had some cost of issuance paid and I just received the bill for the final amount of that. So that'll come in Mar on the March report and we'll be done paying the cost of issuance. There was no activity on the 2020 budget report. So on the 2019 capital budget, we had revenues received for tributes and we had expenditures paid towards tributes, a stump grinding contract for um, out, that came out of the Emerald Ashbore hazard tree work line. And a payment was made to the University of Illinois for the archeological study in Leal Park. And there was no activity in the 2018 capital budget in the 2017 capital budget, expenditures were occurred on construction crew projects. And um, in the Crystal Lake line there at the bottom, a payment was made to ERA, um, our design consultant for the rehab, the lake rehab project. And there was no activity in the 2016 capital budget either. So it was a pretty light month for capital as we're gearing up for our really busy construction season. With that, I believe uh, Derek and Andy have some updates for you on capital projects. Uh, yes, I'll start with the uh, lake project. Um, it's currently out to bid. We had the pre-bid um, meeting last week at the lake house and had pretty good attendance. Um, final questions are due this Thursday to ERA and then our bid opening will be held next uh, Thursday at 2 p.m. here. And then we would anticipate having a recommendation in front of the board at the April meeting. Um, saline habitat enhancement, I think we had mentioned previously that we have some funds remaining from the $225,000 uh, IDNR, uh, IGA, and that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service you know, has um, approximately $33,000 that they would like to also apply to our project um, from another settlement that they had. Um, and so we talked with our contractor last week about the best ways to utilize these funds and providing enhancements to the stream as well as the, the bank itself. And he let us know that he thinks that there shouldn't be a problem as far as getting the equipment back uh, into the stream, which I had a little bit of concern with as far as paying more mobilization um, and more costs associated with them doing that um, uh, in-stream work. Um, but he's going to plan on utilizing the additional visits that he already has scheduled for our project for the landscaping work and the maintenance uh, to help us with the uh, costs associated with those in-stream uh, features. So we're going to um, try to apply as much as the um, fish and wildlife funds as we can to actually doing in-stream habitat enhancement um, rock structures because um, that more aligns with the project goals that they would have in mind for those funds. And then any remaining funds that are left over from that U.S. Fish and Wildlife, as well as our IDNR funds, we can use um, on the stream bank and do some further invasive uh, removal and then replanting of uh, natives. Now, Matt Balk went out to the site and actually drew up an exhibit of some priority areas that he would uh, like to see incorporated, and so we'll make sure that those are uh, accomplished with our next phase. And, and I can do all that without <coughs> putting in that equipment ramp? Or, or right, whatever. that's, yep, yep. I think that was mostly because they were doing a lot of bank stabilization and removing a lot of soil, so they needed that, but 
um, using the park road, they've got pretty good access to Goodman uh, Creek. Yeah. Also, the area where Matt showed for doing invasive removal, <coughs> there's a natural slope down to the creek there. It's on the inside bend, kind of where the park road comes in off of Broadway and, and bends around. And that'll be another place where they can get into the creek relatively easily. And they'll probably be on site um, the end of April, so we'll probably start seeing some more activity there um, in the near future. Just wanted to compliment planning staff for really being ingenuous and trying to find ways to access additional funds and put it to good use before it could possibly be recycled and sent somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Leal parking at the last meeting, we noted that there was an error on the exhibit um, that was completed by the archaeologist archaeologist team and submitted to the state and they were revising uh, that document uh, about a week and a half ago they submitted the revised uh, document which now showed all 11 features within the project area and we held a conference call with the state shortly after that document was received and you know basically we still have you know the options to do a redesign or to do a uh, removal of those uh, features at the site um, we were notified during that conference call that there's typically a setback that's also associated with uh, features for um, construction activity um, that could typically be somewhere near 100 feet, which would then uh, cause quite a bit of an issue with our project. Um, but they said yeah. that they wanted that they'll um, take it back to a more internal review and discussion and then come back with um, a revision for our project and try to work with us. And, and not only our project, right? Uh, IDOT's got something that will be within 100 feet of those. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Eric uh, I mentioned that during yeah, the call right. as well. So that will get more pressure on them to, to revise their... I, we I would requested hope. their permission to send that same exhibit to IDOT and they encouraged us to do so, so I'll copy them. And, um, Very good. I was at the pre-construction meeting IDOT held, I guess it was last week, and mentioned to them what we found and their eyes got pretty big. So, <laughs> um, the point we're making to the state right now, the archaeologist office, is that we've already done the excavation. You know, so we, we don't need to dig any further. Right. Um, so I could understand that setback if you weren't excavating, but we, we're, we're there already. So I think we could yeah. hopefully come up with a more reasonable setback. But if not, we've also talked with the consulting archaeologist on what the cost would be to, to relocate those um, those shafts. And it's 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 not insurmountable. It's, it's really, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's $14,000 uh, for, for what they've identified so far. Um, but I don't think anybody wants to make that our first go-to. You know, mm -hmm. We can figure out something reasonable. Yeah. Um, it's clear that we think that's the state's preference, but we'll find out more when we talk to them about their, their setback requirements. Always something. Well, I think we've learned it is very important to know all of the history of any land you may acquire in the future and have a full understanding of its history and you know, attachments. And, and that was hard in this circumstance because when that property was right. transferred, Correct. the park district was assured that ev everything right. was and fine. W one would assume things were probably done very differently, you know, back then. I'm yeah. not sure well, the and extensive, the, you know, there was, and the law was LIDAR, different. radar, <laughs> you know, excavation. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. We have gone through our historic records and um, when the cottage was moved there, we came across a single coffin and, mm -hmm. and that was ah. properly exhumed and, and has uh, been preserved, I think it's at the State Museum. Um, so we, we have a precedent for doing that. What's interesting from those records is that they found very little. I think, you know, just a, a, most of the um, material has been dissolved because of the condition of the soil. I think it's um, pretty damp and somewhat acidic soil. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's not all altogether certain what they would find if, if, if that's the direction we went. Um, right. So we're still getting information about how best to proceed and hope we can mm -hmm. get the board informed. Anyone watching at home, we definitely want everyone to, everyone to know we're you know treating it very serious. Taking it, uh, you know, doing the right thing is important. Um, right. You know, it was inherited to us, but nonetheless, we've discovered this, and we want to make things you know the way they should be. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention was on our Blair Oslad uh, project. Uh, Kara was notified from IDNR that we should have uh, an agreement from the state probably late April. Um, then we'll need to get signatures on our end and send back to them, but that would then signify that we are ready to start uh, moving forward with work at, at Blair. So we'll anticipate uh, talking with Upland Design, who helped us with that preliminary um, design for Blair and uh, the public meeting uh, portion. 
And then we're going to look to engage with uh, ERA as well as a local project lead. Um, and they've worked actually with Upland Design on a few similar uh, OSLAD projects and actually have one going on currently um, in Rantoul, I believe, right now. So, hoping to get that going soon. Any other questions? All right, let's move on then to the executive director. Sure, just a few updates. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to start off by complimenting all of our office managers at our buildings. They do a terrific job for us um, organizing the buildings. Anything that's new or different or kind of new to the customer, they're usually the first person to begin dealing with uh, change. So just want to recognize all the hard, dedicated work that we have at our main offices and really appreciate their contribution to the park district. They're fun to work with and great staff. Also wanted to mention and thank uh, Commissioner Cunningham for organizing the meeting we had at King Park, over at King School actually, after the vandalism with the Martin Luther King art piece that was attached to the tennis courts. LaShonda organized a discussion group. We had the ch uh, chief of police, staff, and some uh, friends and family and the artist that was there and really had a very good discussion about you know what happened what can we do to prevent it? What are preventative measures? How can we get more of our neighbors around parks to be more observant and be willing to call us? Some other discussions we talked about, even the potential to reinvigorate maybe bike police, policing in Urbana, and we may be willing to contribute um, to help Urbana police. So appreciate that. Uh, we don't always have that opportunity, but it's great to when you can reach out and talk about things like that. And, I always find we always improve ourselves mm -hmm. as a result of that. So thanks to everybody. We had a very exciting meeting in Urbana last week with Norfolk Southern. We had coordinated a um, kind of all stakeholder meeting. Uh, several representatives of the Norfolk Southern Rail Company came to Urbana, had the park district staff, the mayor and the city manager, Champaign County Forest Preserve leadership, regional planning, um, planning staff leadership, and a representative from IDNR in addition to Senator Duckworth and Senator Durbin's aides that were sent to meet with us. So it was a really very good exchange. We had a good chance to really tell our history of the Kickapoo Rail Trail and also talk about the importance and how critical getting the next legs to the um, Norfolk Southern Line. Basically two strategies. There's a short section that would help get us to Smith Road, which would get us tied to our street grid, which could really help us in the future. We'd have more options. And then there was a discussion, how could we could we, and if we could push that further to the west, that's understudy with the state uh, planning and research grant uh, work that we're doing right now. We also got a good perspective from the rail company and how they see the world, you know, that they live and work in. And, you know, obviously we have a lot of work to do. They were encouraging us to follow through with our short section. And so we're going to be meeting tomorrow, uh, Thursday of this week with the, our local stakeholders to get our letter of intent together and get it sent off. Um, there's a lot we could say about the rail companies. We'll save that. We'll have probably plenty of time to talk about that. Obviously, we don't see things happening, happening rapidly. They work at a very different time pace, but we do have some good strategies. We stayed back and really talked about our planning efforts, and, and I think we've put together a pretty comprehensive, you know, approach to how we'd like to do this. In addition, we agreed that locals would go and meet the rail customers that are on this current line and Amulsicote is one of those companies so we made an office visit with the mayor and several city staff um, Kathy Larson from uh, the um, Economic Development Corporation had a very good discussion and learned part of their operation is going to move up stay in Urbana and we'll be moving up to North Lincoln up into the industrial zone where there's good rail service obviously it's going to take a number of years for them to relocate mm. you know their business so we we're encouraged by that because they had indicated that um, while the current rail access right off University Avenue is convenient, they have other methods and other ways. Next follow-up is we'd love to have a conversation with Dart, um, who is also on that spur, to just find out more about their business plans and see if we can be a help um, in any way. So we'll continue with that. We're excited that we've at least got our next steps underway. I want to compliment recreation staff for leading the Read Across America. It was the 20th anniversary. I hear it often at Urbana Rotary because a lot of our Rotarians volunteer at the event, and I think there was over 3,000 people 
at the event and just kids excited about reading and families coming together. It's really, really powerful. Um, so thanks to everybody that has a hand in that. Had also had a very exciting uh, coalition meeting this month. We had um, Dr. I think it's Calvin Mackey. I think he came and joined us to talk about a new uh, opportunity in our area. They're calling it STEM Illinois. It's the um, you know science, technology, mathematics approach. Um, Dr. Mackey's done a lot of work <clears throat> in New Orleans, and they've had successful programs where basically their local schools, parks, all their coalition type members would come together and then once a month they put on a um, STEM event at a local school or a gym or you know a, a large open space everyone's invited it's free sponsors come together and provide the educational opportunity and so a lot of kids get educated it's for the whole family they have a toddler concept is a toddler corner the whole family parents can be there um, as well as the youth so we're discussing that at the coalition and seeing what potential I think there is an event planned for April 25th, and that'll be the first event. I believe it's at Douglas Center. So we'll get more information once I get settled, set up and let everyone know that that's going on. You know, I'm, not, I'm not personally sure what our full next steps, will that be something we do or the coalition or, you know, if so, I'm assuming future meetings, but it's a very exciting and successful program. They do some neat things. Corky staff's going to the all Coalition meeting tomorrow. I think Dr. Mackey will be there and presenting again, so we'll get more information about that. Um, just follow up on Stone Creek. We continue to work with Stone Creek and message and talk with them. Derek and I met with uh, Atkins Group today. I think their uh, homeowner association groups having a meeting this evening, and I think you saw the papers about potential interest from the University of Illinois uh, regarding the golf course. Um, I think it'll be their first all group discussion, so we'll probably learn more about you know the outcomes of that. We continue to offer our help in any way that we could be a you know a solution. Um, certainly, I think they're very serious about you know trying to stabilize you know uh, the existing people that live there, get the message and communication moving in the right direction, and, and make sure we can um, find out and, and see what's what's going on as we go forward. Uh, a couple other, just want to mention we had a terrific uh, legislative breakfast today The Champaign County Forest Preserve hosted. Um, really good discussion there. Most the, of the conversation focused around the Im importance and the benefits of grants, and I think all of the districts and the leaders that spoke really pointed to that and how important it is. It's pretty easy to see what kind of a district Urbana would be without the grants as opposed to with them. So it was a very powerful message. Mm -hmm. Nancy did an excellent job speaking. Thank you for that. Um, tonight, I just want to mention, probably we couldn't make it, but um, Champaign-Urbana Special Rec had their Film 101 presentation. I had intended to go, but we did have our um, executive session, so that was at 6 o'clock over at the Hayes Center. Again, I continue to talk about that in the theater production because it's really unique, and I think it separates what we do in Champaign-Urbana. Um, not many or any of the other special districts are, are doing that kind of work. Obviously, we're fortunate with the university here. We do have access to, you know, arts and culture based um, people that are willing to share their time and talent. So we appreciate that. Lastly, I did want to um, update and open up the conversation a little bit. We, you know, we've been working on our goose management strategies at Crystal Lake um, primarily um, for a number of years. The easy, quick background is, you know, it became very apparent to us a number of years ago. We had a, a goose population issue. We had too many geese for that habitat. Um, things I've learned, you know, during the 1980s when a lot of the subdivision laws changed in Illinois that required on-site retention of all the stormwater, which thus created all these ponds and, you know, perfect habitat for birds of that type. That was probably one of the pieces that probably helped. There are other factors, but that's a physical thing that you could track and see the numbers um, probably start to increase because their habitat changed. But as you know, we've been trying a lot of different things at Crystal Lake and around the lake house. We hear often from our visitors, they just don't like the goose droppings. We hear it from children, we hear it from you know people at the lake house, boaters, people on the paths, all over the park. And it's not only at Crystal Lake, if you go to other places where there's water, there's other parks in the area, there's detention basins and shopping centers and research parks and areas <clears throat> that have that same situation. So we've been following kind of a prescribed approach, <clears throat> trying all sort of the upfront, 
low-hanging fruit, as you will, um, you know, sprays, putting up things on the docks, cleaning up, um, using dogs. We have the laser in the lake. We have the beacons, and we have the you know, green lasers, and on and on and on to our list of, of things. Um, this uh, last week, we had a terrific meeting with the USDA. They came in. They have a service there. It's going to give us a little bit more information. But I think the key point where we are right now is we really need to think about if we want to take that next step to move to a you know a reduction in population um, with the help of you know the you, um, the appropriate parties that would help us with that because we're just getting ready to redevelop the lake uh, lake edge strategy um, concerns we have is you know if we aren't able to reduce the number of geese will they also be out there you know picking away at the seed and the plants probably because that's what happens and we've seen it happen other places um, messaging. You know, it's just difficult for us to talk about transformation. And when people say, you know, I, I'm concerned about the geese and I still see them. Other things that we're tracking and aware of, you know, we have the Park Street Trail and we know there's goose droppings on that trail. And many of the Carl employees go back and forth, the five points. And so just knowing that there's, you know, bacteria and, you know, vectors and whatnot, you know, that we're adding to and not really doing a whole lot to stop or manage, you know, is a concern. So we've, we've talked about that. Um, so again, I think we're at that point, we're trying to get more information, um, but they're not gonna probably relocate on their own. We've had limited success with some of the, what I call physical measures, you know, other aids and tools that you bring to the table. And it may be a time where we have to take on as a district, you know, the idea of culling the herd, so to speak. And a thing I wanted to mention, I'll turn it over to Derek to add in, fill in the blanks that I, I may have um, stepped over. You know, it wouldn't be a, necessarily a one and done. It would be something we'd continue to track. We'd probably still want to work with the dogs and the sprays and everything. So it, it's, it's still ongoing. Um, certainly, we would expect to see some benefits, and we learned a lot from the USDA people about some of the technical factors that make it more successful or less successful based on molting and where birds are and if they pair up and things like that. But we did want to open it up just a few little brief time. We have a little time tonight to kind of get the commissioner's impressions concerns or questions or things you might want to ask us to do or look into further. Again, we don't have a lot of time. I think one of the options that I think is, do we want to do something in the near future as opposed to kick the can or push it down the road or wait to see what happens to the lake planting and react you know, as, as we go there. Um, we understand my last comments, and then I'll share with, with staff. You know, it, it is a sensitive topic. To me, it's a nuisance, and I'll be honest, you know, I don't like it. I'm concerned about the health concerns and, you know, the, the negative image. But on the other hand, I'm a nature enthusiast. I love birds, and I understand they're living creatures. And so, you know, it is a little disturbing. But many of the communities that have faced and gone down this same road haven't found any more success and usually have to get to that point where, you know, if they can't correct it or change it or modify it, they might have to take that next step. So with that, Derek, is there anything I left out or omitted that that's important to give understanding to the commissioners? I think it was probably about seven years ago when at an update meeting, Tim asked the Canadian, you know, what are your impressions of Crystal Lake? Everybody uh, railed on the geese. Uh, they feel like they've really altered the character of the lake. And, we took it to heart. Uh, we had a uh, brown bag w where we invited Roy Domislicki. He was then the urban waterfowl manager for, for IDNR. He's since moved on. There's a new person who's working for it in his place <coughs> to come and talk about what people are doing for goose management. And he gave us a whole series of things to consider. Um, and at that time, he made us aware of, of, of the, the charity harvest program, the culling program. And we kind of tucked that away in, our, in the back of our mind as something that we might consider down the road. Um, hoping, truthfully, that we wouldn't be considering it. He said, you know, to be eligible, you have to do three years of egg and nest management, and um, we're now <coughs> through year four. Um, we've seen uh, some reduction in, in, in goose numbers. Uh, it's not sizable. I think when we started, we had a little bit over 50 nests. We're about 40 today. So there's been some, some attrition. You know, geese don't live forever, obviously, although they, they live for a very long time. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. much um, too long. And you know, in the last two years, we've employed the dog service <coughs> as well, and, and that's been effective at, at corralling the geese so that they avoid areas that we want them to avoid, uh, particularly around the boat docks and the day camp pavilion. Um, but with lake project coming up and with concerns about how they might impact the planting, we thought it was time to 
um, learn more since we're now you know, eligible uh, for participation in the program. And the two things we were really interested in is, you know, what, what has been the, the typical public reaction, you know, to, to this program? Um, we know that there's going to be a segment of the population that, that won't be happy about it. Um, egg and nest management, um, I think we, it was a very slim uh, portion of the population yeah. that had concerns. And, um, you know, we had our open house there and it was well received. This, this will be different, uh, and, and, and that was confirmed by, by the Department of Agriculture. They, they said that um, people do get pretty upset about it. Um, this particular individual who works at the Department of Agriculture said he has had death threats. Uh, he's had people um, throw things at him that are, that are uh, uh, not very um, uh -huh. tasteful. Uh, not biologically. Found objects. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, so th that, that's, that's, that's considerable, uh, and we would uh, be required to do a public meeting. We would, we would do it anyway. Yeah. Um, I think we'd actually go above and beyond with their, requ their requirement. It sounds like most districts have them come and present at a board meeting, and then the board hears it and makes a determination. I think we'd want to mm. work in advance of that. Um, the other one was, you know, what, what is the, the, what, what's the outcome of this in terms of the goose population? Um, what's the return interval, you know, in a, in a lake like, our, like ours? And um, they couldn't say for sure. Uh, they said certainly geese will, will return. Um, that's why continuing your management is critical. Um, with the lake rehab work we're going to be doing, the, the buffer that will help, uh, continuing the egg and nest management, the dog casing, that will all help. Um, at Behringer Commons, where they did a, a did one about seven mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. they're now getting back to the numbers where they're they're talking about coming back. In fact, they think they'll be back next year to do mm. a call at Behringer Commons. Mm. So, their best guess is you know five seven years. Um, we have really good goose habitat in terms of the islands. We won't have as good a goose habitat in terms of our lake edge. So it'll be an evaluative thing. And working with uh, wild goose chasers who's trained us on our uh, egg nest depredation protocol and also put in touch, us in touch with the dog management service. You know, they've always said the, the charity harvest is, is sort of their, they try to avoid it. Uh, but they also acknowledge that for some districts it gets to the point where you just have to consider it. Um, so we're, we're kind of at a point now where we could um, move forward. Uh, it would need to be relatively quickly, uh, which in some ways is an asset. You know, I mean, we, we could have a um, brown bag, invite other agencies to come, uh, learn from the Department of Ag uh, uh, in terms of what's being done, very similar to what DNR did, uh, but also talk more about the charity harvest. Um, and then that same evening have a public meeting. Uh, they would attend both and present at both, and then um, shortly thereafter uh, present it to, to, to you all uh, to, to you know, formally uh, make a, a board action. Um, and that would certainly you know, reduce the population sizably. Um, I think wild goose chasers is suggesting maybe 25% of what we have is, it seems like a, a sustainable number for us. Uh, what the Department of Ag would encourage us to go ahead and try to get every, every bird you can because they'll miss them inevitably. You know, uh, even resident geese spend some time away from the lake and there's also during uh, molt season something that's called a molt migration where young adults uh, fly off and, and seek to, to, to um, nest elsewhere. So we would have some return birds uh, for sure. Uh, the other option would be to, to do our best for the next year and try to protect the planting. We already have goose grids planned for around the, the lake. They said we could possibly spray you know, the, the plantings with uh, the same chemical we're spraying <coughs> um, that would require frequent applications and, and see if that works and, uh, and if not come back in a year from now uh, at, at the point we're at today. Um, so. Um, I think we really want to kind of take the board's temperature on the issue, knowing that it will be um, controversial for some folks, uh, but would help to reset the clock and ensure some planting success. Uh, ultimately, where we want to be is a 25% population. Without it, um, with continued hazing and, uh, and egg and nest management, I think we'll continue to see a, a slight decline over time, and we'll probably be able to continue to protect areas in the park that we want to. Um, but there'll still be a big population. There, there could be some impact. You know, obviously, um, uh, I want to compliment staff. <clears throat> we've tried lots of different things. We've taken our time, been patient. We've had a little bit of success here and there, and not so much success. We've spent money. We've invested. You know, in, the beacons were not inexpensive, you know, to install in the lake. The ongoing dog operations, you know, there's a cost to that. So it's kind of feeling like, you know, we've run out of 
workable tools that will make a reasonable impact that would encourage people to come back to the park. You know, if the end is, hey, there's still goose droppings on the decks or, you know, we do our best to try to clean up and keep things disinfected. But, you know, it's that reinvestment. And then if people won't come back or they're still unhappy or they, you know, just aren't, you know, settled with, with that, that impact, um, we'd hate to lose, you know, visitors to the park and, you know, it, it's hard to talk about because it sounds like you're choosing people over wildlife, but we do have a wildlife conflict. I think we started, as Derek said, years ago. We started looking through our Natural Areas Committee. We did a whole study for at least you know six months on deer, geese, other wildlife concerns or situations like beaver or you know other smaller uh, animals. And we just really, you know, the deer issue is a bigger, we see community, regional, almost area-wide issue but what are we going to do at Crystal Lake to protect our asset? Uh, we don't welcome this. We wish all those methods would have worked or that we would have just hit the magic number where we could have coexist and not have a real, you know, where they'd be noticed and appreciated instead of, you know, cursed when you step in a pile. Um, I, I failed to mention the two other things. One is that uh, DNR and Department of Ag commended us. They, 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 they said that uh, we've done it as much. Yeah. Um, as any agency uh, in the state of Illinois, with the possible exception of Chicago Park District that they've worked with, they were impressed by everything that we've done. Right. Um, two, uh, the, the goose issue does continue to come up. So as much as we'll have detractors, we have supporters. Um, even in the strategic plan, um, in the work we did with UPDAC and, uh, and the community, mm -hmm. these continue to come up. So there's, there's also a lot yeah. more that are concerned. Well, just speaking as one board member, I mean, we're making plans to spend millions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, in that park. And if we're not going to do something about the geese, then we need to change what those plans are significantly. I mean, I, 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 you, you, it can't go on the way it is. I thought of that too, Michael. You know, if that's very good. I didn't mean to yet more to say. I was just going to say, you know, the design is specific to, you know, a walking park, an event park, mm -hmm. uh, a special event area. If we were going to more of a habitat, you just come and fish, and it's sort of like going to the woods. I'd, well, that I might would be a reason. Actually, suggest goes. something different. If we if we're not going to take serious mm -hmm. control action on the geese, what we should be thinking of is filling in the lake. I mean, let's get serious. Right. It's it's not a natural lake. It is an amenity that this community has enjoyed for many decades, and it's being despoiled right now. It's terrible, and there's no way around that. And if we're going to spend multi-millions of dollars putting in trails and, and fixing these things up and not do something about the geese, uh, the, the public ought to string us up. <laughs> Somebody's going to be hurt here. <laughs> That's feedback. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. And we, we, it resonates, I think, with staff. You know, we're in that probably difficult position of, you know, we're friends to all. We have a lot of associations, but we also understand park management, urban design, how you run events, what you need to have, you know, with an event center. And if people want to say, okay, well, it, it, it's nature, it's it's not nature. The predators are gone. The predators do not survive well in the urban environment, but the geese do. And they've even been protected. I mean, there have been limits to what could be done about it. It's, it's not a normal nature situation at all. Yes, if we could correct it, certainly I would agree it would be better if you could return to a, you know, a state when geese would migrate and go to another place and not necessarily live there. Um, it also occurs to me that, that um, some of the board members and certainly some viewers at home may not be familiar with the term charity harvest, and so we should right. at yeah. least explain what that is. Um, it's, it's work done with the Department of Agriculture where they come in during the molt season and um, collect the birds, um, euthanize them, and then process the meat. Uh, it's good donated to a, a food pantry, so mm -hmm. um, it's, it's uh, not gone to waste. Right. Mm -hmm. 
We've come a long way if you think back to the days when there were folks who wanted to put a plaque on the bridge for that goose that was yeah. wandering, and we had to have signs up that said, don't feed don't right. feed the geese. I think there's been a real sea change in people's attitudes toward geese, which is a, a help to us. So that, And maybe the, 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 the Canada goose problem wasn't probably as big as it is as it is now. I don't think mm -hmm. that it was quite <clears throat> such a problem. I'm wondering, though, if we're not just kind of spitting into the wind and not in that we're not trying to, I mean, I think, we, I think this is something that we need to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm on, I'm happy to call, not personally, I'm happy to have somebody <laughs> call, call those geese because, mm -hmm. because they're a problem. But are we not in some ways just saying to the geese in the surrounding area, oh, look, space is unoccupied, apartments for rent. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I know that I've talked about this before. I think that this really is, if we could approach this from a, a, a wider area so that we had neighborhood organizations, homeowners groups, all of those, um, all of those various entities working together on this problem. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know exactly how we do that. I don't know who's the one to who's the one to start that. But I think n nobody's happy to. Have, very few people are happy to have that geese. I mean, the Baytown. My mom used to live up there, and they're you know they're working real hard, and they have been over the years to get rid of those geese. Mm -hmm. So it's n it's not just us. But I think if we alone are doing it, in in a sense, we are um, we're taking on somebody else's problem because the 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 geese from Baytown and those other places are going to be moving into us and then we are in, ending up having to manage them. And I realize that, that it's, it's, it's a never-ending never process, but if we work in a larger area, we may have a better chance for long-term success. DNR uh, issues the egg and, just man, egg, egg and nest management program uh, permits and um, they issue a lot in our area. Mm -hmm. uh, sure we can work with them to, to uh, send a notice out to other agencies that are already doing this to join us mm -hmm. for a bound bag and, and continue mm -hmm. to learn more about the process. Yep, right. yep. The Department of Ag has been approached by uh, the Village of Civil about their concerns. Of, uh, Good. And the Department of Ag encourages them to reach out to Champaign and Urbana. Um, I know that they're calling in Champaign. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about Urbana. Um, I don't think they are. Um, but they did attend our brown bag um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a few years back. And so I think that would be the a next step is to continue to bring people together to talk about yep. uh, these yeah. Two points I want to add <clears throat> to Nancy's comment. One, we hope the new design will have more positive, you know, effects to try to reduce the attraction. Right, we can't right. guarantee that, you know. Um, I've been told by others, geese will still come, they fly in and fly out, but maybe they won't nest or, you know, yep, yep. live there permanently. Right. You'll still have some impacts. Um, so we, we certainly hope that. And then with deer, we are starting to have those little bit larger conversations, you know, trying to enlist the university. And, you know, we've talked with Yankee Ridge subdivision. You know, they're definitely interested in being a stakeholder and oh, really? trying, to, trying to find resolutions. Again, these are hard things to do and takes time and effort. But I think we've kind of starting to build some interest where the university is may be willing to take a lead we're suggesting somebody bigger than upd has got to stand up and say we're going to step yeah. up and do our part um and give you know let the little guys fold in and gals you know with us um i just don't think it's realistic that we become you know the leaders particularly on the deer issue because they're so far and wide on the goose thing we we agree talking with more reaching out but it does seem like each group has their own little you know pond or so to speak, to take care of. So maybe we could, by example, find a way to do it and share educational opportunities. Hey, if you're interested, we've done it. We're having a class or a master naturalist connection or something right, right. to educate and share that information so that others know, wait, you, gotta, you have to do a lot of other things, try things, and then get to that place. And it is sort of an arms race, really, when you yeah. think about it, because it's just, it's been an escalation all the way. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of the final. And Final I'm not aware of any like immediate area, Champaign Urbana, retail research, university successes. Hey, we've done this and this is working. We don't have a problem anymore. I've heard Baytown is really 
really invested with the dogs and, and they're not seeing a, a lot of geese there. I think their lake edge is a little bit different planted it is. Than, than ours. So anyway. Well, I, to me, telling is that, that we're going to be sp spending a lot of money here and we got to get established a, a new lake edge yep. and to have the existing goose population perhaps preventing that from, from really taking proper hold. Uh, I, I would not want to wait a year in order to, to do some of the culling. I yep. think y y you got to put, put everything into it from the get-go uh, that's, that's available. And, and then we see how much overall effect we get and, and can, we, can we buy a few years uh, or more from having that design in place and surviving. <laughs> Uh, do do um, various areas cull annually? Does it become an annual cull? Or? No, not, not that frequent. If we had a, a large molt migration, if we had a lot of failed nesters, mm -hmm. um, some groups will come back a second year mm -hmm. uh, to, to try again. They're encouraging us not to egg and nest man manage the, the nest the, the year that we do a coal. So you have less geese doing a molt migration. Huh. Um, in Matt and I's observation, we don't have uh, that kind of response to Crystal Lake. We, we think our numbers are consistent even after we manage the nests. Um, however, given that that's the Department of Ag's recommendation, um, I, I think we're apt to follow it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we would hold off on doing egg and nest management this year to try to mm -hmm. make sure we um, reduce our population as effectively as, as effectively as we can in year one. Yeah. It's um, yeah. I, 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 he, I, he said that typically you see five to seven year return interval. Right. And I agree. I I would like to I would like to see a more regional, more area wide mm. approach to it. But this really has to be a both and, yes, because yes. like Michael said, we 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 really can't sacrifice the, an expensive lakefront to uh, to our existing population. We need to we need to reduce it. Yeah. Right, you know, I, I hate to say this, but it's right obvious. You know, if we do all that work and things start to look nice, but we still have the goose issue and it's apparent and people. It's going to be very difficult to say, come on, they reinvested all that money and then they wouldn't do anything about the geese. And I think that would frustrate visitors. Yeah, it's wasted, it's wasted you know, it just, money it, and time the at sense that point. That, uh, it's not making sense to me, so I'm struggling with that. And, and I think if there is a time to do it, there have been so many complaints about water quality. That's right. been yeah. such a major yeah. issue. Right. I agree. That it would seem that there would be more support for culling now um, than there might have been some years back. We agree. Yeah, I would agree. I think, <clears throat> well, let's compliment ourselves. <clears throat> Having followed all the recommended protocols, achieving them but not seeing the results the way right. we have done all that, and I think that compliment that or UPD and Chicago Park District, that's a pretty strong comparison <laughs> yeah. from people we don't even know. You know, they're saying you've done all these amazing things and you're still having these challenges. So that was, for me personally, for any of the one that would care of the public listening at home that was a turning point for me where I knew we had tried all the right things kind of took the patience and the time and still put up with customer complaints and hey we're trying this we're trying that but to get to the point where ethically I could say yes we have tried and we do have a human wildlife interface conflict but we have to take a choice that will benefit the park and the success and the future of our visitors yeah, and then no hunting is an is a part of that because these are in urban centers, mm -hmm. that's not even a net a normal way to, to cull mm -hmm. a herd, which right. we can at least do in some areas with the deer, right. but not in the urban center. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I mean, so I, 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 away. Right, so I mean, I, I guess I liken it to that, right? It's it's how we manage other wildlife population areas. Just that this is in an urban center, and right. um, it causes. I mean, there are other types of less friendly wildlife in right. urban centers, which are right which are just poisoned, like, sure. you know, like, I'm not, I mean, they are rats, let's, I mean, Chicago does sure. this all the time, but, but exactly. they have a little bit, they are different, but we're still talking about, right. 
issues with animals right. and human conflict. And there's other areas where geese are not tolerated at all around airports. They have culling programs and oh, yeah. places, you because know, I can't think with, of all those yeah. places, but there are sure. places like that, that, you know, it's, it's not negotiable. They're not going to try a six year trial, you know, program right. to right. see if something works. Um, so I think that's where we are. And it's sounding like there's support for the board for us to move this along to the next steps and organize the next steps yep. that are required to get this in place prior to the redevelopment of the lake yep. in hopes of that, having a better that outcome. That's the crucial point. Yeah, I yep, think. right. Yes. So the sooner the better, really. Okay. Understood. And it's not that we're not a bird. <laughs> Oh, of course. <laughs> well, again, I think those educational opportunities will give us a chance to go through all the protocols and under, make everyone that we can share, put it online, make sure we have Mark in the Park stories about, you know, so that it gets out there as much as possible. Well, so. and, and let's get real. You want to talk about bird friendly. I mean, it, it's an out of control population. Right. And, and, and they are clearly displacing right. other species. Uh, other mm -hmm. species. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and they're very aggressive. Yeah. Lastly, I would, when Michael said bird friendly, it reminded me of, I think it was last month's, we had uh, Beth Chato here giving us the annual report on Audubon. So I think our record on being bird friendly and being conducive to wildlife <laughs> yeah. is, is probably a marked history. So I think it would be difficult, you know, um, for people to make that case. But I think Derek's right. We just have to be prepared, you know, for, for that kind of situation. Um, yeah, well, well, hardly anything we do is pleases agreed. pleases Everyone. everybody, 100%, and right. this will no this will just done. bring out a, a, a more right. vocal, unhappy, right. unhappy group. And right. as long I think when you anticipate that, it makes it a little bit right. e easier to bear and to deal with. Right, and, and you then, don't really you can't really take it personally. At that. Yeah. And if we can get people to understand, this is just another step in the management. You know, we yeah. may be back to these other techniques and periodically have to re revisit the you know the culling process. So I think it's a continuum. Um, it's not, well, we're done, and we've resolved it. That's all I had in my report. Okay. Can answer any other questions. How do you call, just out of curiosity, how do they call the birds? I think they, go during, ahead. During, during the molt season, when they can't fly, they um, corral them, uh, capture them in live pens, and take them to get them euthanized and processed. Mm -hmm. oh. It's very humanely done. I just had no idea. Yeah. Good question. You won't be the only one asking how it's done. No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to the uh, president's report, uh, upcoming meetings. I think we still have the uh, Park Foundation dinner in, in two days. Right. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> so far. Mm -hmm. um, up deck meeting on March 24. Then our study session in April is uh, the 7th, and the regular meeting the 14th. Um, uh, listed here is focus group reports and an action plan, but I think from our executive s session today, we were likely also to be discussing uh, employee compensation. And, and an executive session before the meeting. Yeah. 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 I okay. expect, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then uh, come the April 14th, we've got uh, authoriz authorizing actual uh, compensation actions and preliminary budget coming in if it's going to be ready at that point um, and uh, revise our current year capital projects budget if as we need and it's always an annual redo of the current fiscal year's budget comes in in April and uh, the approving resolution that designated committing and ending fund balances which is part of that process so um, other than that, I didn't have anything further report. I think we're going to be talking a little bit more about COVID response at a later point in the agenda. Otherwise, I was going to raise that topic. But since we have that policy that we're going to be talking about later, I think we can oh, broaden that discussion a little bit. Sure. Um, moving on to liaison reports uh, the finance study group uh, did meet uh, last Friday um, unfortunately Roger was not able to attend but um, actually everything that we discussed has pretty well been covered uh, already tonight or else is on the uh, agenda later uh, we did have a, a, a conversation about the, the COVID-19 uh, measures and that's coming before us here later in, in this meeting um, 
UPD policy study group? The policy study group met. Unfortunately, I was not there. Um, uh, but the, they, we met on March, or they met, LaShonda met with them uh, on March 3rd to discuss board policy changes, which are coming before us uh, later on the agenda as well. Uh, there are revisions for the investment policy prohibition on balloon releases in parks and policy updates regarding the use of security cameras. And uh, Urbana Parks Foundation representative Roger, I you was not able to attend yesterday. I, I, I did uh, attend in your stead, although I didn't, I did not vote. <laughs> but, um, but I think maybe you had already mentioned uh, from, from the previous month, but there, there, there are two, two new uh, board members in Bill Gray and Amani Ayad who were, who were both there. I, I, I think both seem quite eager and, and, and raring to go uh, to, to get involved with this. So I think that's a, a couple of- Amani of being a former up deck. Yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. <coughs> so mm -hmm. nice. Okay. Big circle she's made yep. around. And there was considerable discussion about uh, about both the dinner and the the uh, later on coming the the barn bash. Uh, so they've already got some of the some uh, corporate sales for the barn bash. Although they've got a ways to go to to finish it, to fill all the the, the tables they want to in that way. But uh, some some good lively uh, new people. Um, yeah, which I'm quite pleased to see. Yep. I had not been to one of the meetings in a while, so. Um, UPDEC planning study group, is there anything We have not us? met. I'll, I'll speak for you if you're having trouble. You. <laughs> yeah, we, ha we haven't met. Okay. Any, any questions about the liaisons? Uh, moving on then to old business, uh, there was no old business removed from the consent agenda, so we have nothing to deal with there. And under new business, uh, first item is action on ordinance 2020-02, revising chapter seven of the board policy manual. So um, you'll see there's several policy updates tonight. Um, we actually, the balloon release was one that we've been talking about for quite a while, but we had held off on it until we kind of had a grouping of Mm -hmm. other minor policy changes to add it rather than just throwing it on the agenda but with the spring season coming and the nicer weather we really wanted to get it in the fold and uh, have the board talk about that one but before that uh, chapter seven uh, the revision to chapter seven is an update to the um, park district's investment policy to better follow the uh, public funds investment act from the state of illinois the, I went ahead and included the entire Public Funds Investment Act so that you could, and I also included our entire investment policy, just so that you could see that our investment policy really falls pretty well in line with the public act for uh, public investments. And the change is very minor. It's just extending the maturity out from um, what we currently had listed of 180 days to three years for certain corporate obligations. And um, these would be things that like Busey Wealth Management that we work with would allow them the opportunity to diversify our portfolio in those ways. So um, they handle the English fund, for example. So by updating this Paul's, this fairly minor change, it's just, it brings about uh, another opportunity for the district to try to receive some higher returns on investments, um, which with the current state of the economy, who knows, but um, it just, uh, I also think it's important that we, um, accept this too because it was an IPD legislative effort to get this changed. So I think it goes to show the district's need um, and that we support the efforts that IPD puts forth on our behalf. Do you, you feel, I mean, uh, not taking, ignoring the fact that the market is just bonkers. <laughs> Before that, would, would you have foreseen this as being of particular use to us is a little use to us how do you I would say it's fairly minor um, I don't know you know I I haven't purchased any investments in corporate obligations I mean as business manager mm -hmm. but it would probably be something that the investment managers that we work with would consider if it was uh -huh. part of our investment policy um, and honestly I don't even know if they used to even offer uh, corporate obligations for the, these long of terms until more recently anyway. So it may have just been as part of a change with the times as those investments uh -huh. became longer term because they have always in historically just been really short term investments. Okay. So it may have just been kind of keeping up with the current state of investment, investment, you know, management. 
So, yeah, I think it's pretty minor, to be honest. Okay. You know, and I think I think also just by keeping all of the other limitations on that particular investment type in place in our investment policy, and it's also in the act, but you know, no more than 10% of your investments, and you know, so far, so far, so forth. Um, it's it's pretty low risk to have this one minor change. So I think we're in good hands. When Katie <clears throat> presented it to me, I, my suggestion was anything we can do to help people that manage our funds in a way that would give them more options. As Katie stated, it's not something she would necessarily be doing, but if, if it helped you know, one of our vendors, yeah. you know, it seemed reasonable to advantage ourselves if, if we could. Yeah, could or, you know, if... Um, if I Iptalaf Plus, if they got a, you know, if this was something that they might be able to help us diversify the new bond money temporarily or things like that, I just once we update it, I'll be sure to change to share it with everyone that helps manage our money so that they can mm -hmm. further advise us. So, I, I I realize this language comes directly out of the statute, mm -hmm. and at the same time, when I look at this and the scale of things, I would like to make a change to it. Sure. So. I mean, the law requires that the corporations have to have assets exceeding $500 million, mm -hmm. which, you know, hey, that fine. But item number two, such purchases do not exceed 10% of the corporation's outstanding obligations. I mean, really? <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Where are you? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Great. It's on page three. Page three. Yeah. Of it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I would suggest that while line three, which no more than one third of the public agency's funds may be invested in short term obligations of corporations, but that's of corporations plural. Maybe we could limit ourselves to 1% of the corporation's outstanding obligations. Sure. And it would not hand tie, uh, handcuff us in any way. Man. Uh, it just seems to me we want to emphasize that this is not a, a pond we want to play in very much. Yeah. Well, I'm happy. I mean, I think that as part of the motion, we can make that change as well tonight, or I can bring it back after further discussions with our investment managers. I mean, whatever you'd prefer. Open. I, 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 well, I would offer it as an amendment to, to, to make this 1% as opposed to 10% of the corporation's outstanding obligation. I, we, we just don't want to be taking risks. Yeah, I'm open to that. As our little fish. <laughs> so how do we add that on then? Um, well, uh, approving it as amended. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> As amended, okay. I mean, as long as we're all clear on what number I was talking yep. about. I got it. <laughs> so I move to revise Chapter 7 of the Board Policy Manual as amended. Second. What's that, a, a sec second? Silent second. What was it? That was, okay, that's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion on the point? Uh, this should be a roll call vote, and let's start on the right this time. Aye. 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 Okay, and that carries unanimously with all five commissioners voting. Uh, next item is action on ordinance 2020-03, revising chapter six of the board policy manual. Okay, so this is actually two sections of Chapter 6, so it's two minor changes to the policy. Um, the first is the balloon ban, the prohibition of balloon releases um, as part of our refuse policy that recognizes balloon releases as littering. Um, so that's that change. And then the second change is a recommendation from uh, Lorna Geiler, our attorney with uh, Meyer Capel, who recommended that we uh, <coughs> remove some language from our security camera policy. As it's kind of all explained in the memo, but I'm happy to answer any questions or um, discuss any of these further. You know, we talked about them at policy committee and it, it wasn't the first time we'd even talked about them. It just finally, it, it was time to bring these before you. So we wanted to really put it on as new business so that if anybody did have any other questions or concerns or wants other 
information, we can provide that. Well, I, I, this is perhaps crazy, but I, I do want to be sure that um, this policy would not prevent hot air balloon launches from our parks. Right. <laughs> no, it would not. I mean, I mean it's, but is that truly the way? Yeah, I mean, it, this is it, about, you know, people in a celebration going yeah. and release, no, that's, releasing helium that's, balloons. I understand and, that's the intent. I, I, uh, and I guess if that's a launch as opposed to a release. Well, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you got to you yeah. got to release the balloon or it won't <laughs> it won't go, right. but yeah. They're not launching the ones on a string. Yeah. And well, typically they're not linked to litter. No, but yeah, no, I get it. I, well, I mean, we just had people come in and say, "Well, well you understand. know, you <laughs> yeah. due diligence one way looking for people to skirt our policies." Um Yeah, yeah, for memorial so purposes. That's question. We need to we need to encourage them to throw bird seed or there's other things. You know, offer, right? You know, so most people that probably don't know that it's a problem or it's not a good idea or that wildlife eat them or that kids could eat them and choke and things like that. Oh. You know, young you toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking. Well, I was thinking. Yeah, how do we how do we alert? the public to this you change know, honestly our... it, it's one of those things people could still come into the parks and do but occasionally we'll have a rental or we'll have a group come or there might be a special use permit hey we're coming together and we want to release and then that's when we t and then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can't stop us it's not in right your, well and technically right, right sure, sure technically it really is already covered because it is littering to we right, right right let your garbage yeah. go in our park but we really wanted to very right. express but if it's going to float away to somebody it. else yeah, it's going to be somebody else's litter if it's not ours Right, right. I assume yeah, that yeah. there is a contract that people sign that it's indicates what they can and can't do. So, because mm -hmm. I know when I was a pastor at our church, they, we expressly forbade a balloon release. Mm -hmm. um, oh, re oh, oh, so it's not on. It's not an uncommon. Not a lot of oh no, we, we were doing this now. ten, fifteen yeah. years ago. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and we no bird seed, no right. We had a woman break her hip on right. bird seed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> So, wow! Yeah, well, I mean, they're like little they're tiny ball them. bearings, and uh, she fell and and, and broke her hip. <laughs> so awful. we we said bubbles. bubbles. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there'll be t some toxic effect of bubbles that we'll find I out about know. sooner. Yeah. Yeah. That's the part. Bubbles are, are, are not indicted. Race, so <laughs> the bird seed, and then they start rolling on the bird seed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Golly. It's terrible. You'll learn more stuff here. Bird <laughs> seed. Well, so, yes. um, yep. There you go. I can stay in place. Yeah. No, I was just going to make a motion. I, I move to revise <laughs> Thank you. Chapter 6.0 of the board policy manual. Second. That's been moved and seconded. And uh, uh, I, I guess is, it is clear that it, Exhibit A is what is the, the is the revision that, that we're talking about. And yeah. as, pre right. as presented here tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, both of them. Okay. Yep. Is there any further discussion or questions? Um, hearing none, let's do a roll call vote. We'll, we'll start here with Ashanti. You can just raise your thumb if you want. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, was a, that was a yes. But so is this, yes, aye. 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 And that carries unanimously with all five commissioners voting. Uh, and <laughs> lastly, action on the personnel policy <laughs> manual. Uh, Are you going to? Oh, sorry. Are you going to present this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, Where are we? Obviously, staff had met and you know um, talked about you know things that we could do to try to protect ourselves. How can we ensure that our own workers can be you know covered that they'll have reasonable paid leave and um, <clears throat> so I obviously following the you know the the warnings um, we definitely think that. Adjusting our, you know, manual to to incorporate that um, would help us with the, with the understanding of, you know, eligible uses of our acute leave. Right. 
and, um, and as it relates to the, the COVID-19 And situation. this does have a sunset date mm -hmm. in it. Correct. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. yes. I can comment on this too. We actually modeled this after uh, policy or change, sure. you know, a temporary policy change that uh, was instituted for the H1N1 uh, pandemic, mm. I guess. Uh, it, we did this exact same thing. It was a nine month window uh, that basically covered flu season. It started in the fall of 2009 and went through like June of the following year. So that's, that's really how we got the majority of this language um, and, and how we decided as a group, you know, we reviewed all of this, but at the time, you know, the board did approve a very similar version of, of this same policy. So I just have a question about mm -hmm. the, the statement that says in which the employee in the one, two, three, fourth paragraph uh -huh. uh, displays symptoms even if it's less than five consecutive days and even if the employee does not see a doctor. I think in this case I have concerns about not seeing a doctor just with the nature of what's going on. I feel like we should be encouraging people to be tested. So well, well, or what, what's, how does this work? The reason the language says that is because our acute policy, our policy for use of acute illness leave right now, the only eligible reasons are if you're like on an FMLA leave right. or if you're ill, you have to have been ill for five consecutive days with a doctor's note. So that's the only way that you can access it for sickness is if, or overnight hospital stay. So there's, there's very limited reasons. And so we want to encourage people to follow the guidelines to stay home without okay. them, you know, right. but, but I think from what I've heard in the news, I mean, they really are kind of saying like, don't, don't overburden don't the it. hospital right, right. system. Yep. And yep. Right. you know, if you're, if you're just sick, just stay home, you know, right. if you're not in critical condition or don't need it. I mean, some, we have no idea, but it, it sounds like some people just have a bad cold and, and then they get better. So, you know, in that case, don't come to work, but you don't also necessarily need to see a doctor. So we're trying to remove the barriers. Some doctors may see patients, some may not, or just say, don't come into the office. So we thought it seemed reasonable under this tight situation that we would, you know. And I totally agree with that you way. that, yeah. you know, testing is important. Of course. And if anybody, right. we don't want to discourage anyone from right. seeing a doctor. We just don't want to make it necessary for the use of the policy. And in two weeks, they may be telling everybody something different. Right. Get in. Please do come. Yeah. Then right, right. Obviously we want we everyone would say tested. Recommend, That's fine. You know, Please follow your doctors. Yeah, did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I think so. Okay. Remind it's me. a little new territory also. Mm -hmm. So if the ending date was somewhat arbitrary. We talked sure. to policy you know, with LaShonda. Mm -hmm. Let's just pick a reasonable time. We can adjust it after that and extend it or modify it. Yeah, that's the did. date of yeah. the board meeting of September yes. so that we could revisit. And we also kind of talked as a staff that, you know, if the whole thing breezes us over and they give us right. the all clear, then we can retract it. Yeah. So right. we just we just kind of tried to put something in there that was reasonable. Right. Um, like I said, the H1N1, it was nine months. Right. So. And again, the propensity to, uh, I don't know if I should miss work, what, I'll just go to work. We're trying to break that circuit of you don't feel well or you're just even concerned or someone in your family, then maybe you make that option. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's a short duration and we're back as we were. Remind me again, I know I asked this question. Mm -hmm. um, how are the hours accrued in the acute illness bank? They, um, they accrue at four hours per pay period. So it's an ongoing accrual up to 1,920 hours, which is basically one year of service credit that um, when an employee terminates employment, um, if they're retiring, that rolls over into IMRF service credit. Um, but if not, they, they don't get paid out for those funds. So, mm -hmm. And short of a brand new employee that maybe hasn't built up anything. Right. You know, they should have most some. Most people have some. Yeah. So. It was probably, lastly, it was probably the only one thing we could deal with on the economic side and also reduce barriers. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to be an effective tool, you know, for this limited approach. Yeah, and from our recollection from the 2009, you know, one thing we worry about with this is, well, are, you know, are all of our employees going to be calling in sick tomorrow and abusing it or things? But we don't recall there being anything like yeah. that. But it's certainly something that we'll watch. And sure be cognizant of but you know I think by having them actually really sign uh, something that says they're experiencing symptoms you know probably when they return but um, knowing that they need that it's there's documentation involved it's not just calling in sick mm -hmm. so certainly anybody with three or four cases of COVID you'd be suspect of, you yeah know, <laughs> encourage another yeah. A, so. a second opinion yeah. you know maybe. Oh, yeah. 
you, you got yours, and then you got each of the kids. <laughs> well, <and then laughs> we actually, Michael did hit a good point. Mm -hmm. We did discuss that, yep. and that that would thank you. That that's very legitimate. Yeah. Well, in our existing policy on 480 hours, which is 12 weeks of leave within a calendar year, is still in yeah. instituted as well. So, uh, minor point. I think there is a missing word. Oh, please. Uh, in, in in paragraph four. Mm -hmm. The fourth line down, the board permits the use of acute illness leave for illness in the. Yeah. Yep. We'll add it then. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I see that. Um, ah. And yeah. I, I wouldn't propose trying to fix it tonight, but I would raise the question uh, in the uh, fourth, in the sixth paragraph. It's saying um, they they can use acute illness leave if they must care for school aged children. Well. Well, if you got yes uh, oh, preschool kids, parents, or you got day, you know, your daycare center closes down. I mean, uh, they're uh, oh, are yeah. Children. Uh, children. Yeah. Children. Yes, 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 children. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can, minor, can we amend minor that minor right children. now? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. Are you okay with changing it to minor children? Oh yeah, that would sure. be fine. But I, I mean, I did, you know, that's a little more substantive than, Thank you. than a yeah. missing word. But that's yeah, a good point. yeah, and it, and sure. it really covers yeah a, a, a range, a necessary range. I think. Right. Yeah, right. I think that's a well, good, that's whereas, a really good idea. Well, okay. I mean, I, I guess a, um, a high schooler is still a school-aged child. I mean, it, it, I mean, there's at some point there we figure it could could be okay at home alone, but. Right, no, right. That's not for us to right, yeah. try to nitpick. That's exactly special right. needs yep. or yeah, yeah. 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 It's just, this prevents yeah. a lot of right. questions and yeah. having to yeah. explain. Yes, and it, and it covers everything. It well, and I, I think part of the idea there was, well, the school's going to close because of this issue or something like yeah, that. Right. And, right. But so could the daycare. So yep. could the yeah. I get you. Thank you. I saw. It. I already changed it on mine too. We'll change it on the form on the back side as well. Okay. We'll have to reword that sentence because it talks about school closures, but. We'll make those changes before we send it to staff tomorrow. Yeah. It's interesting when we start looking, drilling down on policy, you often Thanks. find other little things that, you know, the common vernacular of, yeah, school kids, you know, when you yeah. have to analyze what's that mean. And, no, I appreciate that. Right, that makes we sense. We do appreciate it. Well, then I move to approve the temporary adjustment to the personnel policy manual regarding the eligible use of acute uh, illness leave as amended. Second. That's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion, comment, or questions on this? Uh, hearing none, no, we should hold a roll call vote. And uh, I forget, but we'll do it at the left again. Aye. 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 And that carries unanimously with all five commissioners voting. Um, I, that brings us down to there was no new business removed from the consent agenda, so we're to comments from commissioners. I don't know if they care. I just want to thank the staff for the meeting that we had and planning at the last minute around your schedules to come and. Um, talk to the public and talk to us about, you know, the neighborhood parks and everything that's important to us in the community. So I just want to thank you guys for coming out. And uh, the weather was terrible, um, but they still came out and, you know, to support. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Any others? Well, I'll, I'll just throw in one comment. Uh, more for the public out there watching that we're entering a, a period of great uncertainty um, and it is it, the, we're going to have to be nimble and agile and ready to change gears in a hurry um, if things go far south as they may well do um, and I hope the the public will uh, show patience with us as we scramble to do the best that we can in what is likely to be a very challenging period of time. Thank you. Yep. I move we adjourn. Uh, well, okay. I think we have indeed exhausted our agenda, so let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>